you got a Bible, turn to Ephesians chapter 5. This scripture will be on the screen. If you, don't, if you would like a Bible in hand, and I encourage that because I think it helps us to know how to turn around. There's Bibles at the back. I see there's one there, and there's more at the table at the bottom at the uh, downstairs. If you don't have a Bible at all, you're welcome to take it and keep it. If you uh, just want to use it for the service, you can put it back. Uh, there was a baptism of coffee. This is what the scripture says. Therefore, be imitators of God as dearly loved children and walk in love. As Christ also loved us and gave himself for us, a sacrificial and fragrant offering. Sacrificial and fragrant offering to God. But sexual immorality and any impurity or greed should not even be heard of among you as is proper for the saints. Obscene and foolish talking or crude joking are not suitable but rather giving thanks. For no one recognizes this. Every sexually immoral or impure or greedy person who is an idolater not have an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. It's kind of a frightening scripture, but we'll look at this today. So if you haven't been with us for a while, we've been looking at, or not before, we've been working through the book of Ephesians, and just seeing what God says to us. It's a great foundational book for us. But the, the other day I saw this meme that expressed what a lot of people seem to live, and it goes like this. Check this out. This morning, I accidentally changed the GTS voice to male. Now it just says, it's around here somewhere. Keep driving. Uh, the interesting thing about that is that's how it's a lot of people seem to live their, their lives. It's, it's like, where are you going? It's, I'm guessing it's around here somewhere. I'm coming to church. Why are you coming to church? Well, I'm guessing I'm going to get some help here somewhere. I'm, I'm guessing there might be something in the vicinity. It's, it's around here. I'm just not sure exactly where it is. I'm not exactly sure even what I'm after sometimes. But I'll recognize it when I see it. And it just feels like that's a, a way many people, uh, many people live. Like, where are you going? What's the purpose of life? Why are you here? And I think on top of that, there seems to be and I was just thinking about people, the, uh, maybe this is the, the heart cry of our world is, you know, that that's people are looking for is that it's trying to figure out where they're going and why they're going there. But there's also this desire, this longing for, for love, to be loved. I mean, it just seems like it's one of those longings that is uh, sa saturating so much of life, but... Um, never been found. So people look for love, looking for real love in so many different things, but it always seems to be a little limited and elusive. So you think you've got it and then it's gone. We fall in love and then we fall out of love. We, we pursue love and so we we go, oh man, I, I, I just want to be loved. And so we figure out how am I going to feel loved in the way that I can create that feeling. And as a lot of this world is just like that. They, they're going through it like, well, I, I'm looking for this thing which only God can give. But I don't want God to give it, so I'm going to find it in another way. And so people are immersing themselves in their work lives and they immersing themselves in their sexual lives and they're immersing themselves in other things because they are uh, and you're going how does work life relate to love because you're wanting people to love you and people aren't loving you so you want to love yourself and you you're looking for love and affirmation and caring about yourself so much that we're missing it so much of the time 
There are times in life when we need to stop and analyze where we are. Because even Christians can be like this, you know. And we need to just stop and look at wh- where am I in this thing. Uh, uh, you know, it's around you somewhere. Just keep going. Let's, but no, wait, we need to actually stop, find our coordinates, and go there. Because I think it's easy to just continue in life. And this is something we should do regularly. And this is something that it feels like the Apostle Paul is bringing on the brakes, even at this point in the letter, just calling us to just get something that know where we're going, know what we're about. And so he says, be imitators of God. And what does that look like? He goes on, walk in love. You know what? To be an imitator of God is to walk in love. But we need to understand what that love looks like. We, we're called to imitate him. And uh, he's the embodiment of, of love. And as we imitate him, we walk in love. God is love. To imitate him. It's to walk in love. And this is what the Apostle Paul is after. And some num- a number of really important things that he highlights here. The first thing is this, that love is modeled in Jesus. You want to know what this kind of love looks, at, looks like. You've got to look at Jesus. You won't understand this love apart from Jesus. Because any other definition of love that we this world creates and gives to us is a wrong definition because it's it's self-serving and self-centered 90 percent of the time and sometimes we're just asking the question what does this look like and what are we supposed to imitate and then this is the thing just look at jesus what does his love look like and i think that there's some great examples here it's because we first see it's active Christ loved us love is active love is never passive how many times we, we want to love I mean, just like can you imagine me waking up in, in, my, uh, in the morning like, Jenny I love you and then going to just be totally upset with myself. It's like, no, how do you know that, how would Jenny know that she is loved? Only through action. It's not simply a matter of words. It can't be. It's not feelings. Feelings, I can feel in love, but, uh, you know, then you wake up the next morning and you suddenly feel out of love. You get grumpy over something little and something small. There's some... Uh, the, the love has to be driven by something bigger than just my simple feeling. And here's the thing. Real love must carry some kind of ability to choose to love in order for love to be genuine. So what I'm saying is if you can't choose to love, there's no action and there's no love. So if God just made people often go like uh, accuse God of uh, why didn't he just you know make us so sin didn't work well how do you worship apart from a decision to worship is it worship if you're just robotic in your worship is it love if you're just robotic in your love no it's got to have something that's a choice within it for it to be real God, it says here, Christ loved us. That was Then it's like, think about this. It's focused and unexpected. He loved us. I don't know what you, what goes through your mind at that point when you hear that, but this was focused on us. This love was focused on us. Christ loved us. 
We were the object of his lo love. Now, I don't know how you respond to that, that point. But how should you feel? When you hear that Christ loved us, what's the response that you should feel or do feel? Contentedness, peace. So that's a, it's the fruit of knowing he loved us. Safety. But isn't there something of what? So that's the consequence of that. But isn't there something that, go back a bit. Don't you feel this holy amazement? Like what? He loved me? He actually loved me. If we're not feeling that, we haven't understood ourselves as well. We don't understand how radical this is. That He loved me. He loved us. In Romans chapter 5, it says this, While we were still sinners... There's not meant to just be, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Wow. <laughs> of course he loved me. I mean, I'm just so lovable. There's actually the opposite. We, we should be left in with a holy amazement. He, he what? He loved me? Did he know me? Yes, he knew you. He knew your heart. He knew how desperately wicked your heart was. And he came to your life. Christ died for you. Somebody was watching. The guy's name just slipped my mind. But he, he does these videos and he goes to people and he says, do you believe that you're a good person? Like, yeah, I believe I'm a good person. And, and then it's like, uh, have you lied? Have you lie? Like, well, not really. It's a little white lies, but, but you lie. Yeah, so you're a liar. Yeah. Okay. Uh, have you committed? Uh, have you committed adultery? Well, uh, I, I've not. I've never sort of done. Have you looked at pornography? Yeah. Well, the Bible says that if you lust after a woman, uh, you know you've committed adultery in your heart. So you're an adulterer. Okay. You're a lying adulterer. Um, have you stolen anything? Uh, what do we call somebody who steals? A thief. Ah, so you're a lying adultery, adulterer thief. And he goes like this, and suddenly the guys are going, oh wait, maybe I'm not as good as I really thought I was. It's like, have you blasphemed? And the guy, no, well, no, I don't blaspheme. But you've just used Jesus' name three times in this conversation. That's blasphemy. The guy says, so you're blasphemy, blaspheming, adulterer, who's a thief and a liar. And, and so we start to realize, but this is what I'm like. And while you were still a sinner, friend, never, lose, never lose sight of that. Never lose awareness of that holy amazement and wonder of God who loved you so radically and the nature of God's love that we are led to worship. And there's no neutrality in, in this kind of love. That's not like you can't remain neutral. It's a, I embrace it or I reject it. There's no neutral space. And many of us want to try and balance that sometimes. We want to live like we want to live. Oh, but I want to know God fully loves me. And, he, uh, uh, and there's a space in which you receive. But this is also, when I say it's focused and it's unexpected, it's, it's focused on us, but it's also focused on the Father because everything Jesus does focused on the glory of the Father. Just have a look at the scripture, John 17, and because uh, I think it sums something up. Jesus spoke these things, looked up to heaven, and said, Father, the hour has come. Now this is just before he's taken to the cross. He says, glorify your son so that the son may glorify you. 
since you gave him authority over all people so that he may give eternal life to everyone you have given him. Everything that the Son did was for the glory of the Father. Going to the cross was to glori glorify the Father. This love was for the glory of the Father. He loved you for your good, but for the Father's glory. He saved you for your good, but for the Father's glory. Everything we do, everything we say, must be glorifying God. And this is what, because that's what God did. But listen, it goes on, it says, he shows us that it was sacrificial because Christ loved us. And look what the next step sentence the phrase is. And he gave himself for us. That's sacrificial. You want to we're we're learning what what this love is that we are called to walk in. He loved us and he gave himself for us. That, that's a pretty high cost to show in love. Given himself, but it wasn't the father who went to the cross, it was his son. But there's this, there's this Godhead plan and working that God himself, God gave of himself for us. He didn't go, hey, I mean, some of us are really good at sacrificial stuff. Like, as long as it doesn't affect me, I'm going to go, uh, you need some help, I'll find somebody to give you the help. Like, ah, uh, I'm, uh, yeah, I, I know somebody who can do that for you. You know that you can, but hey, I'll find somebody else because that's an inconvenience. So there's this call. Let's, let's, let's love with sacrifice. And we think that, the, the, that we love with no sacrifice, but the kind we can love with no sacrifice, but the kind of love God has for us was as shown in active and personal and costly sacrifice. So we, in theological terms, we talk about penal substitutionary atonement. Uh, big words. You got it, eh? Uh, what did I say? Uh, I said, uh, okay, so penal substitutionary atonement. Let me give you a quick uh, a definition on that one. Uh, because he loved us, he took our place, the penalty of our sin, so that we can be right with God. He took my place. He took, by doing that, he took the punishment, the penalty for my sin. What is the penalty for sin? The wages of sin is death. died instead of me. He could because he was the only perfect man to ever live. You know that no one could have done that? No one else apart from God coming for us because he was alone as perfect. Penal, substitutionary, in my place, substitute, atonement, making us right with God. This is what God has done for us. And it was complete Look, it goes on and says, a sacrificial and fragrant offering to God. This offering satisfied a holy God. That sacrifice was enough to bring us life. What love we have. There was no more that needed to be done. You don't have to do any more than G what Jesus has done for you. You've got nothing you can do. You've got nothing. You, we, we go in our world like, well, what can I give for that? I mean, we struggle even if somebody shows us grace. And it's like they, they show us abundant grace and we go, well, what, what can I do to repay you? No, it's, it's free. And that's a picture of what Jesus does because in, in infinite measure, he takes our place. He gives us uh, the offering of eternal life. He says, take it and we need to receive it. By faith. We go, oh, what, what can I do to earn that? We can't. Jesus. Think of the 
think if there's another word that for me sums it all up, it's self. He gave himself for you. And that's the kind of love we receive. Selfless. That's the kind of love where we call to show. Selfless. A radical selflessness. He's saying, imitate God, be imitators of God, walk in love. How are you doing on that? I mean, I, like I'm standing in front of you today going, but guys, this is the picture of love that God has set for us. This is the model of love that he has made for us. And how are you doing in that? We, we are okay with loving ourselves. But how are we doing in loving God and loving our neighbor as ourselves? I mean, really, how are we doing? I, I was sitting there before, well, during worship, and thinking, man, I think God is busy rattling City Hill Church and rattling what we we find it up where our comfort zones are. Because we can't take this and apply this without some fairly radical shaking in our own lives. Isn't that right? It's like uh, some of us might be kicking back and going, I don't want to, I can't, I'm, well, but you've been loved like this. Crazy that we oh bring the love, but I'm not going to share it. That's a madness. Do you think that there's a limit to this love? Can't, there's no limit to the love we we receive. So like, can there be a limit to the love we show? So it's, it's modeled. In Jesus, motivated by Jesus, then as well, we're called to walk in love. Jesus motivates us. This, the gospel, what we've been looking at, what Jesus has done, or God, the way God has loved us, motivates. Because I know that I've been loved like this. And this is what he says. You, I want you to get this. You have been loved. Are you receiving that today? We're the recipients of this love. It's very personal for us. He, right in verse 1, he says, As dearly loved children. Oh, but I'm an adult. Uh, shh. It's amazing. It doesn't matter how old. Speaking to a bunch of so called adults in this room who are still children. Takes me right back to the last two verses of the previous chapter and reminds us that because of God's love for us, we've been sealed in Him and we've been forgiven by Him. And what a thing to go, I have. I've been sealed in him. I have this full confidence of the, his love. I'm so secure in this love that will never let me go. And then I, I've been forgiven. I walk in freedom. Oh, forgive, forgiveness of my fault. You've been loved. This is the Paul here. Love. You're called to love. Our love is clarified because love always has an object. There's always an object in love. It's either self or others or God. And you go, well, people love things. No, they love things because they love themselves. That's why they accumulate things. People go into all sorts of different experiences in life and 
uh, relationships that aren't honoring to God because, hey, they love themselves more than uh, they love God. Just love. You've been called to love. You've been called to love God. That's your primary purpose in life. Love the Lord, your God, with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. Everything. Every, everything that makes you as a person is, is called to love God. We, we're, not, we're not given this thing of, well, that part of you loves God. Sundays, you give God your Sunday. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, that's yours. You can do what, whatever you want to do, whoever you want to love. But Sunday... to love our neighbor. <laughs> this is a challenge again in my notes. Like, what if we love God like God loved us? What if we loved our neighbor loved like God loved us? What do you think would happen in, in City Hill Church if we loved each other like God loved us? I want to tell you something. This would be, we would have people I've got a team. So ready. So ready. I think Moses set the example for us in this. Um, and some of this is just loving like Moses loved God. Check this out Hebrews chapter 11, verse 24. And. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to suffer with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasure of God. Think about that. What is he loving? What love is being expressed in Moses? Loved the people of God. He loved God. He's not going to love this world so much. And then it goes on. Now he, uh, for he considered the reproach for the sake of Christ to be greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, since he was looking ahead to the reward. Some of us have short sightedness, so we can't see far enough to see how the love of God prepares us for eternity. We want to love this world. What happens if I miss out? Radical. When we love like this, God is pleased. But let me just say this as well. Love is mine. love the wrong thing. We can pursue wrong love and sometimes when we allow secondary things to become ultimate things, what happens is we lose the object the object of our love, the proper object of our love is lost and given to smaller things. So when you know in this passage he talks about sexual immorality what sexual immorality is? It's any sexual activity outside of marriage. Anything that's outside that's not proper. See, here's the thing. Satan is an expert in taking what is good and in giving it something like that. Destroys marriage. Good, what is good become ultimate. And when we take what is good and we make it God, that becomes idolatry. I'll get back to that in a moment. But see, that's why sexual the uh, sex is 
good within the boundaries that God has created, it's, and that's marriage. It's a, it's a sign of covenant. Many people are like, ah, we got to test, you know, test drive before marriage. What happens if it doesn't work out, you know? What happens if you're not sexually compatible? Like, oh, good. You're a man, you're a woman. Hey, it's going to work. Don't worry about that. That is something that we need to learn again in our sex. The world has distorted and warped the sexual ethic that's gone outside of the boundaries of what God's design is because we want to pursue self-love and not the love of God. And not love for ourselves. Impurity. That's a broad, broad term. It's the second thing mentioned here broad term that involves anything we allow into our hearts and lives that defiles godliness. This vessel that is meant to be for God, it's a temple of the Holy Spirit, what we allow to defile, that's what we put in, what we take in. But look at these things. There's, there's a time when, I don't know, you, you, you're sitting and you maybe watching a movie and you're by yourself and it seems, oh, it's okay. Like, but you're aware that hmm, somebody else is in this room. I wouldn't be watching this movie. Maybe you shouldn't be watching that movie. Yeah. The next thing is greed and covetousness. That's unrestrained desire. Um, it can be for food, possessions. So, so many things that rob us of control. Sometimes it even like we we take in good gifts from God that we should be sharing, but we're hoarding. That's greed. Like when I take, I I think some of these we don't talk about enough in this church. Like, oh wait, we have more than we need. All of us. I reckon probably most of us in this room have way more than we need. Then we just get more. Hey, get more. Get more. Thank you. Ready for love. It speaks about contentment as well, and not just celebrating, uh, you know, the good gifts, and not celebrating the good gifts. Uh, to others. Contention is something we need to see as well. But these should not, he says, should not even be heard of among us. It's out of place. Sexual immorality, impurity, greed, covetousness. You know why it's out of place? <coughs> it's not from God. 1 John 2.16 1 John 2.16 says this for everything in the world the lust of the flesh the lust of the eye and the pride in one's possession is not from the Father but it's from the world you said that sometimes those are things you fuck man I want that That means we can express wrong love as well. And there's two indications of a person's character, what makes him laugh and what makes him weep. Think about it. What makes you laugh and what makes you weep. He goes on to talk here about foolish, crude joking. It's his language that makes life a sin. Instead, he says, let there be thanksgiving. Why thanksgiving? Have you thought about it? Like, it goes quite radical here. He says, you know, so don't let any sexual immorality or impurity or greed, uh, that shouldn't be heard of among you. It's not proper for saints. And then he goes, obscene and foolish talking or crude joking are not suitable, rather giving thanks. 
Why? The reason is thanksgiving centers our hearts on God in a way. I start to look for his good gifts. And I give glory to him. And I do that for God. Imagine us being a people who just I pray to God. Thanksgiving to him. This builds up. And those things are wrong because they replace the ultimate one, God, in our worship. And that's also the so hey, why that's what Ken Dai was saying earlier when we went to him to worship. He, he enjoys it, you know? But we can worship the wrong love. And when we replace what we love with a lesser thing, that becomes our God. Anything we put in the place of God is an idol. Idol is Simply false worship. Now, this is a frightening reality. Idolatry breaks that relationship. So, when he says here, goes on to this, and he says, you know, just think about this. Um, for know and recognize this: every sexually immoral, impure, or greedy person who is an idolater—that's idolatry. It's not neutral. We sometimes go, "Oh my!" Like oh, they had a fling. No, it's idolatry. That's uh, going into the relationships that are not designed by God. That's idolatry. That's frightening. You can't be a Christian and content to be in a sinful relationship, an idolatry, a place of idolatry, and be happy there. It's incompatible. If you're a Christ follower, you've got the Spirit of God working in you and going, nah, -uh, that's not where I want you. You're not going to be happy. You will not be happy. You can quench the Spirit all you want. God is calling you. So, at the end of the day, as I look at this, I go, love. The love that we are learning about must be mastered after the example. How do we do it? How do we get there? I think we get there by, by looking at Him. God, that's Him. This is the love that I have. This is a love that's so radical that delivered me, that changed me. I need to understand God's love. You know, we, I, I, I will talk about being gospel-centered, having the gospel at the, the center of our lives. And this is what it is. It's going back, look at the love of God to me. How amazing is that? And this is the thing that unites us. We are people with the love. We're, we're a different group of people than this. We're around it, one two. Do it. Love sacrificially. Love the God. Love your neighbor. How do you get that? You might be in the place where <coughs> self-love is the dominant thing. If you're not sure about that, ask people who know you and actually love you. You know, we sometimes we go to the people who will tell us what we want them to tell us. And they, they don't love us enough to tell us. realize there's things that you need to repent of, that you need to lay down, you're too consumed, too taken up in the wrong things, uh, you know, uh, and it's a reminder that uh, God has, here, right there, that God has loved you, and this is the amazing thing here, those people who are excluded from God are the people that God has loved because He's loved the sexually immoral, He's loved the impure, He's loved the greedy person, He's loved the idolater and he's called them to himself because those are the people he will. For 
give. Too many people just won't move past what others have done to them. You can't. <laughs> hey, if you're struggling with forgiveness, can I just say something? You're never going to get past that until you make it. If you're holding grudges against somebody, that's going to hold you back in life from all that God wants you to do. You want to, you want to get past that? Anyway, forgive them. And forgive them. Don't bring it up against them again. Forgive them. We need to find a place of liberty. Liberation, where, where this is that song that we're singing, a new one. Hey, did you? I'll find, yeah, that one. I'll find it there. I speak to you. Just think to that, eh? And it's just speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind, and I know that it's peace. You're not going to find that peace until you follow the ways of Jesus. I want to speak the, the name of Jesus until every dark addiction starts to break, declaring there is hope and there is peace. Maybe there's some here today who are just stuck in those addictions. I want to speak the name of Jesus over, every, over fear and anxiety to every soul held captive by the flesh. live as captives. We don't live as slaves. We live as free people. Because we forgive. We do We forgive. to respond. So we, we, we can't just go on like, oh, okay, yeah, whoop, that's life. Done that one. 